are you starting to feel the pressure now? For instance, Dances with the Wolves, big hit. We see you Academy Awards. There's Kevin Costner watches out now. People looking for Yeah, that's kind of stupid, isn't it? Okay, but are you starting to feel a little like maybe the Well, I'm feeling, well, no, there's two kind of pressures. There's a professional pressure and there's a personal pressure. You know, I prefer to talk about the professional pressure. Are you starting, well, okay. No, I don't feel it. Because I, you know, I, I just make movies, you know, and uh, I don't have to really live up to anybody's expectations but my own. And my own have served me very well with, with audiences to this point. Yeah. How does one define a star? Is it just their box office accumulation or is it more? The answer is box office, of course. And perhaps no one has learned that lesson harder than Kevin Costner. Raised in Compton, California in the 1960s, as a child, Costner was not an adept student and showed more interest in athletics, especially baseball. And due to his father's busy marketing job, the family of four was forced to move frequently, making it difficult for their youngest son to make permanent friends. It would be in college that Costner discovered his love for the performance arts. And following graduation, he would take odd jobs while pursuing further acting lessons after abandoning a potential career in his father's footsteps. After a couple of minor roles in mostly minor films, Costner would find his breakout role in 1985's revivalist western Silverado and would star in a smaller film, Fandango, that same year, also co-starring alongside Kiefer Sutherland in a special episode of Steven Spielberg's Amazing Stories. By the early 1990s, the actor was seemingly on top of the world. His career had hit a stride in Brian De Palma's Academy Award-winning crime epic, The Untouchables, where he played famous Prohibition-era agent Elliot Ness, going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Robert De Niro's Al Capone. He would embody one of history's most legendary heroes in the medieval blockbuster Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, and take on the entire United States government in Oliver Stone's sizzling controversial political thriller, JFK. He would be contacted from beyond the grave to build a baseball field for deceased Major League players in Field of Dreams and again homage the world of baseball in the hit romantic sports comedy Bull Durham. Not to mention co-starring alongside Gene Hackman in No Way Out and sharing the screen with Whitney Houston in the romantic thriller The Bodyguard. Oh, and Dances with Fucking Wolves. Costner obviously loved to play the unlikely hero and would see a nearly six year stretch of almost complete box office and critical glory, only seeing a couple of minor missteps along the way, but what actor hasn't? This bankability made the All-American star one of the most powerful players in all of show business, and it appeared that the actor was truly unstoppable. And then it happened the film that altered the trajectory, the film that bombed so hard it killed the resurgence of the genre it emulated and, in hindsight, signaled the beginning of the end of Costner's nearly flawless run. That film, of course, was Wyatt Earp. Wider. It all ends now. Released in June 1994, the film premiered at the number four spot at the weekend box office and would go on to be a financial bonfire for Warner Brothers Studios, also receiving mostly unfavorable reviews from critics and audiences, Roger Ebert calling the film long, slow, and unorganized. However, fortunately for Costner, or so it seemed at the time, 
the actor had a backup plan. A film that combined environmental messages, eye-patched zany villains, ancient mythologies, and the adventurous flair of Errol Flynn, all wrapped up in a big Mad Max packaging. It would also be one of the most disastrous productions in Hollywood movie history, pitting its cast and crew against Mother Nature and each other, and going on to unintentionally become the most expensive film ever made at that time, ultimately culminating in a venomous PR war. And for actor, producer, and eventually director Kevin Costner, it would become his white whale. Good smoke if you miss your mom. Never too young to start. No. In the mid 1980s, aspiring filmmaker and recent Harvard graduate Peter Rader had just moved to Hollywood with aspirations of making a low-budget genre film as his premier directing vehicle. Via connections through friends in the industry, Raider was soon contacted by producer Brad Curvoy, future founder of the MPCA, then working for the office of B-movie mogul Roger Corman, under the name New Horizon Pictures. Curvoy tasked Raider with creating a cheap knockoff of George Miller's dystopian action franchise Mad Max. The agreement being that Cravoy would allow Raider to helm the film himself, intending to produce it using mysteriously acquired South African financing. The mid-1980s saw a rise in popularity of the post-apocalypse action B-movie subgenre, all of course stemming from Mad Max, and Cravoy was eager to cash in on the craze. One day while on a sailing excursion with friends, Raider sparked the idea of Mad Max, but on the water, 
imagining a future Earth completely covered by the sea and immediately took his epiphany to Cravoy. However, Cravoy and Corman feared the film would cost multiple millions to produce and chose to pass on Raider's proposal. Undeterred, Raider ran with the concept himself, completing an entire spec script in 1986. Raider's original concept infused many more obvious religious connotations and references, especially the story of Noah's Ark, the original name in fact of the Mariner being Noah, who also at that time had a secret white horse on his river barge. However, Raider always maintained the bare bones elements of the genre, namely a mysterious loner coaxed into saving the world while on a prophetic quest. The film is also essentially a western on the water, Raider drawing inspiration from many films of the genre and heavily inspired by George Stevens' 1953 classic Shane. However, after sharing his script with a colleague who was a more established Hollywood writer, Raider became discouraged by his friend's highly critical feedback, and Waterworld would be put on the back burner for nearly three years. During this time, Raider found the opportunity to make his feature film debut, the 1988 horror thriller Grandmother's House. And while the film is now considered a minor cult classic, it failed to find much of an audience at the time. However, with the exposure of a feature film, Raider quickly found himself gaining more influential Hollywood connections, dusting off his Mad Max on the Water spec script and shopping it around town. In 1989, up-and-coming USC producers Andy Licht and Jeff Mueller, hot off their comedy hits Little Monsters and License to Drive, were pursuing projects in more adult-oriented genres and were captivated by Raider's concept, calling it a spaghetti western on water. The partners shared the script with producer John Davis of Davis Entertainment, a more established player in the industry who pushed the idea even further up the Hollywood food chain to producing brothers Chuck and Larry Gordon, Larry having recently founded Largo Entertainment. The brothers were ecstatic over Raider's concept and hoped to move forward with production immediately, envisioning the film as a mid-level release and setting the budget at a relatively modest $60 million. The producers initially tapped Norwegian filmmaker Niels Gaup to direct the film, having then recently received an Academy Award nomination for his 1987 adventure drama, Pathfinder. However, Gaup would quickly leave the project, concerned that the scale of the film would be more than he could handle. In early 1991, director Kevin Reynolds came across a copy of Raider's script while in circulation and was eager to pursue the project further. However, unbeknown to Reynolds, his frequent creative partner, actor Kevin Costner, had also read the screenplay and was considering making the film his next project, which would further elevate it to a higher status. Waterworld would mark Costner's fourth collaboration with Reynolds, having worked with the director on 1985's Fandango, Costner's Oscar winner Dances with Wolves, Reynolds being a second unit director on that film, and 1991's Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. However, Costner's history with Reynolds was complicated, the two famously butting heads over creative differences on the set of Robin Hood. Costner would only accept the role if Reynolds directed, Costner wanting a director he was more comfortable working with, having known Reynolds since his days in film school. Despite their personal history, Reynolds initially declined to partner with Costner again. However, producers John Davis and Chuck Gordon forced the creative friends into a hotel room in Lake Tahoe to settle their differences, Costner shooting the bodyguard there in 1992, and Reynolds eventually agreed to sign on to the project. Costner followed soon after. The friends appeared to have reconciled. With Costner's addition to the project, Largo Entertainment could no longer sustain the budget that would be necessary to produce a megastar's next blockbuster, and soon turned to a major Hollywood studio, Universal Pictures, to not only distribute the film, but to also enter as financiers. Unfortunately for producers Andy Licht and Jeff Mueller, who were the first to support Raiders' Waterworld concept and partly responsible for its ultimate production, were not so politely dismissed from the project by a Universal executive. After a brief legal battle, however, the partners were able to maintain an executive producer credit on the final film. 
Despite everything seemingly gearing up for pre-production, Costner first wanted to make a film about one of his favorite American legends. You guessed it, Wyatt Earp. And the studio also felt that they would need at least a year to prepare for Waterworld's unprecedented production. The film was put on hold. Three hundred years ago, Easter Island had a different name. They called it Rapa Nui. During this hiatus, Reynolds took the opportunity to take on the notoriously difficult 1994 historical epic Rapa Nui, which saw an arduous and challenging shoot telling the story of the creation of the famous Easter Island heads. Costner would also co-produce the film in order to secure additional financing, a gesture of good faith to Reynolds before the two dove into Waterworld. However, Reynolds was unaware that the studio was considering potentially replacing him for a bigger name, considering directors Robert Zemeckis and Lawrence Kasdan instead. Fortunately for Reynolds, neither of the directors would come to terms with the studio in time for principal photography to begin. Just as production was set to start, writer Peter Rader was dismissed from the project. After completing a total of seven drafts for the film, the producers feeling they needed a new voice for the story and Rader agreeing. Rader's script had developed as more of a fantasy adventure film instead of a sci-fi one. For example, Deacon was originally named Neptune, wearing a full beard, holding a trident, and sitting on a clamshell throne and his smoker henchmen were described as having oceanic mutations. The producers felt they needed to go in a slightly grittier direction. To take over the writing reins, the producers first turned to Blade Runner scribe David Webb Peoples, but the much sought after writer was unavailable. Next, in came writer David Toohey, who had found early success writing in genre cinema, with now cult classics such as Critters 2, The Main Course, and Warlock on his resume, and he had just found his career launching pad in the 1993 Harrison Ford thriller, The Fugitive. Toohey's primary contribution would be altering the tone of Raider's original concept to be grittier and more realistic, and infusing more Mad Max into the story. After the script was brought to a point where everyone was more or less satisfied, Costner brought on board a then young Hollywood writer named Joss Whedon to polish the script, Whedon having gained recent notoriety for his rewrites on 1994's Speed. Whedon was primarily tasked with working in additional ideas from Costner himself, a process Whedon later referred to as Seven Weeks of Hell. Whedon would add more levity to the film overall, heavily revising the dialogue of the smokers, and in addition to actor Dennis Hopper's own embellishments, would give Deacon many of his more memorable lines. The script would continue to be a point of contention throughout production, seeing a total of 36 drafts and 6 writers, although Raider and Tui would be the only contributors to receive credit on the final film. Raider would find little success in the world of screenwriting following the disappointment of Waterworld, with only a few minor credits to his name over the last couple of decades. David Toohey, however, would continue to find a career in Hollywood, going on to create the Pitch Black slash Chronicles of Riddick Vin Diesel starring franchise. Because CGI was still in its infancy in 1994, the producers chose to shoot the film in real ocean water, a dubious endeavor that had infamously nearly destroyed entire productions in films past. Nevertheless, the producers chose to push forward. While Australia had been considered as a possible shooting location early on, winter had arrived by the time principal photography was scheduled to begin, and in June 1994, the production was instead moved to Hawaii filming almost entirely off the coast of Kailua Kona on the Big Island in Kauai Harbor. It is odd that Universal chose to film in Hawaii just two years after Jurassic Park's notoriously hurricane-plagued production there, and unfortunately, the studio didn't spend any money this time around researching the weather patterns, unaware that at times, winds could reach up to 45 miles per hour at sea, as well as seeing swells as high as 12 Feet. 
Due to hurricane warnings, shooting would have to be postponed and the sets fully evacuated three separate times over the course of production. At one point, a major portion of the atoll set would collapse during a particularly violent hurricane, leading to millions of dollars in damages. While additional filming would take place in Los Angeles, Huntington Beach, Santa Catalina Island, and the Californian Channel Islands, the state of Hawaii would see a $35 million economic boost as a result of the film's massive production. Shooting wouldn't conclude until February 1995, and additional pickup shots would be filmed as late as June 1995, just one month ahead of the film's official premiere. Unfortunately for Waterworld, and despite their initial reconciliation, Kevin Costner and Kevin Reynolds would, once again, not see eye to eye during the course of production. And Reynolds would eventually choose to abandon the film altogether, leaving Costner to take over his directorial duties, also having to finish editing the film himself. Later, reports would surface that Costner had actually fired his longtime friend, but these claims have never been substantiated. According to Reynolds, Costner interfered with his direction for almost every scene in the film, and he was ultimately given very little control over the creative direction. Costner claimed that Reynolds purposefully disregarded studio orders to cut spending and had gone out of control. Reynolds would, however, go on to receive sole directing credit for the film, in line with DGA regulations. After exiting the film, Reynolds stated, Costner should only star in movies he directs. That way, he is always working with his favorite actor and favorite director. Costner would be on set for a total of 157 days, working six days per week, and would end up having to invest over $22 million of his own personal fortune into the film's production. It would quickly become evident that the megastar never intended to be as involved in the making of the film as he had become, and during a June 1995 interview, again just one month before the film's official release, Costner told a journalist, quote, I did not want to be in the editing room when the sun is shining. That wasn't my job. It wasn't something I signed on for. I didn't want it. I don't know how to make that any clearer. Dozens of boats would have to be used to provide stations for the numerous individual departments, and coordinating transportation from one vessel to another would prove to be frustratingly difficult. There would be no toilets for cast or crew available when filming at sea, save for portable toilets on a barge anchored near shore, although the producers have disputed this claim, and the treatment of the film's huge cast of extras would be ethically questionable, many required to stand out in the open sun for hours on end with little food or water, surrounded by dangerous sets and special effects. Many would quit before the end of shooting. At one point, medics were treating 40 or 50 employees per day. Even one of Costner's own stuntmen would suffer a near fatal embolism while deep diving and would barely recover. The crew was also forced to stay in old, uninsulated condominiums, which were prone to extreme temperature shifts. Costner, on the other hand, stayed in a $4,500 per night Hawaiian suite, complete with a personal butler and his own private swimming pool, leading to widespread resentment and hostility on the set, further negatively impacting the overall morale of the production. Costner was also struggling with problems in his personal life throughout filming. More details on that later and the production of Waterworld would slowly become less about making a movie and more about managing a PR crisis, Costner being painted more and more as some kind of narcissistic villain. In the time between Costner first signed on to Waterworld and the time it would finally be released, another one of his films, 1994's The War, would open and bomb at the box office, also once again being met with mostly mixed to negative reviews. Costner now found himself in desperate need of a hit. While the studio initially authorized a sizable budget of $100 million, the cost to produce Waterworld would slowly balloon to an estimated $175 
million, not including marketing and distribution expenses. This was primarily due to, that's right, shooting on water, camera setups and scene resets often taking hours at a time. The studio heads themselves at one point flew down to Hawaii and threatened Costner directly to trim expenses or they would be forced to shut down production. It wasn't long before the film's financial obstacles and chaotic production caught the attention of a hungry press. Nonetheless, against all odds and apparently at all costs, Kevin Costner was feverishly driven to finish Waterworld, if only so that he could finally escape it. After seeing the Universal logo disappear into a landless planet Earth, which has nothing to do with the plot, but it's just really cool, we learn from a smoky voiced narrator that in the future, the melting of the polar ice caps has led to the planet becoming entirely consumed by water, the remains of humanity scattered across the globe in floating improvised cities known as atolls. A lone wolf scavenger known only as the Mariner uses pure dirt, a rare and valuable form of currency, to gain access to the Citadel, warned by a suspicious local enforcer to keep out of trouble. He trades in his soil and goes for a drink where he meets atoll bartender Helen, also having an unpleasant run-in with an inquisitive barfly. Unfortunately, Trouble soon finds the Mariner when the locals expose his fishy mutation, being a hybrid between human and sea creature. Gills. Mutation! He is swiftly locked away, scheduled to be recycled as a form of execution. Meanwhile, a young girl named Enola and her two guardians, Helen and a scientist called Old Gregor, plot an aerial escape from the atoll, Enola having a tattoo on her back said to contain the coordinates to dry land, and they fear others will soon come looking for it. The next day, as the mariner is prepared for death, the city's alarms suddenly sound as an army of vicious smokers, Waterworld's ruthless outlaws, approach from the horizon, led by their soon-to-be one-eyed leader, the Deacon, who is hell-bent on capturing Enola and finding dry land. A merciless attack ensues. During the chaos, Gregor accidentally triggers the escape balloon early, ascending without his companions. Left with no better recourse, Helen frees the Mariner from his soupy grave in exchange for his protection, and the trio makes a daring escape on the Drifter's fancy trimaran. The memorable introduction of the Mariner seeing the Drifter converting urine into drinkable water was always the character's introduction from Draft 1 and remained throughout the script's numerous rewrites, although Raider's original concept for the purifying device was much more organic, using a real kidney and other biological riggings to cleanse the urine. Wanting to capture the aesthetic of Mad Max as closely as possible, legendary Mad Max cinematographer Dean Semler himself was hired to shoot the film, having won an Academy Award with his previous Costner collaboration, Dances with Wolves. 
Semler and his unit would go to great lengths to achieve shooting the film's complex and innovative action sequences, the ever-changing weather and tides repeatedly forcing them to adjust their approach. Underwater camera expert Pete Romano and his company Hydroflix would capture the film's underwater sequences. The film features several aquatic stunts never before seen on screen, coordinated by R.A. Rondell, and extensive planning, special riggings, and ambitious camera work were brought together to create a true adventure thrill ride. For Costner's superhuman swimming, the actor worked closely with an Olympic-grade swimmer to develop a believable technique, and Costner simply held onto a wire being yanked by special effects technicians in order to create the effect. While most of Kevin Costner's death-defying water stunts were performed by surfing legend Laird Hamilton and stunt double Norman Howell, Costner also performed many of his own stunts himself and was nearly killed when caught in a sudden squall while strapped to the mast of the trimaran for a majestic helicopter shot. The extreme winds causing the yacht to sail much faster than ever intended, swaying Costner dramatically from side to side, the helicopter only about 20 feet away. For the art direction, the producers wanted to adhere to a cyberpunk-like theme, and costume designer John Bloomfield would be tasked with realizing the fashion of Waterworld's inhabitants. The costumes were based entirely on what Bloomfield and his team could imagine in terms of what would be available to humans if the world was actually underwater, including making the Mariner's outfit out of real fish skin. In total, Bloomfield estimated that over 2,000 costumes would be made for the film. Producers also envisioned the film's central atoll city designed with the same philosophy, but on a gargantuan scale. The resulting set would have the circumference of a football field, be made from over a million tons of metal, and would be structurally sound enough to support a legion of cast and crew members and their equipment. Under the guidance of Oscar-winning production designer Dennis Gasner, the set was built one section at a time in Honolulu, and the production would hire over 300 local welders to bring the pieces together, working around the clock for nearly three months straight. The production would end up using all of the available steel in the Hawaiian Islands, leading to additional steel having to be shipped in from California. To assemble the massive sets, the production also converted a recently closed sugarcane warehouse near the water, and the Kona Airport had to have its runway extended 4,500 feet in order to accommodate the massive aircraft shipments arriving with pieces of the set. It would take four cranes to put each section in place, with a total of eight flotation platforms. The final set would be completely mobile, the entire atoll able to be towed out to sea. The cost to build the set, in total, would be $22 million. If you want to break away to some place really cool If you want to play in water that's clean and blue It's here at last, New Water World 15 acres of super slides, rip-roaring rapids, and oceans of motions And it's all right next door to Astro World It's a whole lot better than the beach And a whole lot easier to reach Come on down and play around Water World
Afloat at sea, the mariner reveals that he knows the way to dry land, but grows increasingly annoyed by his two new yacht mates. Following a physical confrontation, the group is attacked by smoker pilots, Helen harpooning the plane, but damaging the mariner's trimaran in the process. The Mariner chopping her hair off in retaliation, later trimming Enola's hair as well for drawing on his boat. While Deacon and his minions plot to close in on the Mariner and his new guests, the group is assaulted by a nefarious traveler who engages with the Mariner in a struggle to the death. After some exotic fishing, Ilona and the Mariner begin to form a father-daughter-like bond, but soon after, the three have yet another run-in with Deacon's clan, who put on a morbid puppet show. The group outruns the smokers once again. No! However, the Mariner is wounded by the Deacon. Helen demands to know where the Mariner found his dirt and other collectibles, alluding to the legend that humans once thrived on dry land. The Mariner finally admitting that he doesn't really know the way to dry land, and instead decides to show Helen what he knows, taking her to the ocean floor and passing through the remnants of an ancient civilization. They resurface to find Deacon and his men aboard the Trimaran, surrounded by smokers, and Enola quickly finds herself in their clutches. <laughs> Helen and the Mariner managing to escape with their lives, but not with Enola. His boat now destroyed, the Mariner and Helen are miraculously rescued by old Gregor and his airship, and learn that there were other survivors of the Atoll Massacre. For this extensive deep sea sequence, the production built a large decrepit model city based on the city of Denver, Colorado. The model was then lit to match underwater lighting and surrounded by smoke, and then filmed using a motion controlled camera, later integrated into the underwater shots of Costner and co-star Gene Triplehorn. For the filming of the scenes on the Trimaran, the boat had to be turned 180 degrees between each actor's take in order to hide the Hawaiian coastline, and keeping the performers in frame became a frustrating experience. Filming at sea also meant that most of the crew would suffer heavily from seasickness, and found that eating copious amounts of ginger snaps was the best way to keep the illness at bay. The film would feature numerous personal watercraft, especially the Kawasaki jet ski used by the smokers, and for the design of the Mariner's unique mode of transportation, the filmmakers were inspired by the products of Genoa Advanced Technologies multi-hull division called Lagoon, and would hire Lagoon's own designers, Mark Van Petergem and Vincent Lariel Provost, to design and construct two 60-foot custom yachts for production. Two different versions of the vessel were built for filming, at a price tag of $1 million each, one made simply for long-distance shots and one being mechanically souped up to perform the multiple automatic functions seen in the film. Costner and Reynolds wanted the Mariner's boat to have a, quote, Swiss Family Robinson-like feel, and to be its own character. 
the production would design a myriad of technical concepts to create a memorably unique movie prop. Costner would spend weeks practicing with the boat in order to make his handling of it feel more natural and fluid. The racing craft used for long shots could surpass 30 knots in speed, and while its special effects heavy counterpart was actually capable of sailing, it was much slower. Today, the effects trimaran is in the hands of a private collector. The racing version was on display for several years at Universal Studios Florida before being sold and restored for actual racing purposes. The Mariner is convinced that Enola comes from dry land, and despite hesitancy from the group, chooses to initiate a one-man rescue mission. As Deacon pontificates to his disciples, the Mariner sneaks aboard the smoker's oil tanker, the rusted carcass of the infamous Exxon Valdez, and soon comes face to face with the Deacon. It's him. It is him. You guys are in so much trouble. <laughs> when Deacon refuses to release Enola, the Mariner drops a flare into the oil, causing the ship to explode. Deacon attempts to escape with Enola by plane, but the Mariner, of course, manages to intercept him. The Mariner reunites with Enola, and they escape the sinking ship via Gregor's balloon. However, Deacon survives the tanker sinking and knocks Enola from the balloon. Giving Kevin Costner one last badass hero shot. Time passes by, and old Gregor finally deciphers Enola's tattoo, and soon after, the group makes their way to dry land. However, the Mariner struggles to adjust to his new life on land, and chooses to leave the colony for further exploration at sea building a new boat and bidding Helen and Enola farewell. At the time of shooting, the film's entire third act had really yet to be finalized. While several drafts had been tossed around, no one could agree on one satisfying road to their climax, which, from draft one, had always culminated on a giant oil tanker, and the details surrounding the ending of the film would really be written day by day. However, due to the film's not-so-subtle ecological message, the producers settled on making the tanker the actual rusted leftovers of the Exxon Valdez, the infamous American oil tanker that spilled 10.8 million tons of oil into Prince William Sound, Alaska in March 1989. The film even includes a blatant dig at the vessel's disgraced captain. A 112-foot full wooden replica of the tanker was built in a large open parking lot in Los Angeles and was surrounded at the base by gigantic blue screens, later intended to be digitally replaced with water, a cutting-edge approach at the time. While the film is mostly known for its exciting practical stunts and effects, visual effects supervisor Michael McAllister, in partnership with Digital Domain, made Waterworld the first film to feature computer-generated water, used entirely for the film's climactic setting, a technology soon after approved upon in James Cameron's 1997 blockbuster, Titanic. The film would also use CGI to create many of the wide shots of Gregor's balloon airship, as well as the sea monster the Mariner hunts and kills midway through the film, all innovative effects. 
The sea creature went through several incarnations before the filmmakers finally settled on a design, and the producers would have to go head to head with the studio executives to keep the scene in the final film. A single CG effects shot costing around $35,000 in 1994. Despite this, however, it was controversially rumored that Kevin Costner ordered the visual effects department to digitally hide his then receding hairline, a rumor Costner later vehemently denied. Additional scenes for the sequence were shot in a large seawater enclosure at Paramount Studios, the tanker ultimately being a composite of several different sets and locations. For the ship's fiery demise, the production moved the entire replica to the Mojave Airport in California, tilting the ship with a crane and strategically setting it ablaze. Fun fact, while never specified in the film, the producers speculate that the story is set in the year 2500, a short 480 years from now. Jean Triplehorn had been recommended to the producers by her agent for the part of Helen, and won the role almost immediately. With most of her experience having been on Broadway, Triplehorn was relatively new to feature film acting in 1994, but already had two massive box office hits to her name, 1992's Basic Instinct, her feature debut, and 1993's Tom Cruise legal thriller, The Firm. Triplehorn chose not to appear nude in the film, and instead used a carefully chosen body double for the scene where Helen attempts to seduce the Mariner. Like Kevin Costner, Triplehorn would have a near-death experience when she and co-star Tina Majorino nearly drowned on their first day of shooting after one of the trimarans unexpectedly sank and almost dragged them under. The name Helen is a direct reference to Helen of Troy, one of the key inspirations for writer Peter Rader's original script. Tina Majorino was just 10 years old and fresh off of her success with the Whoopi Goldberg comedy Karina Karina when she earned the part of Enola, the film's adorable MacGuffin. Although she was not the producer's first choice, as a young Anna Paquin was initially offered the role, but was unavailable. Unlike many child actors, Majorino was reportedly a pleasure to work with, and director Kevin Reynolds stated that she had developed many of her character's traits herself, including the character's obsession with drawing. In addition to her close call with Janine Triplehorn, Majorino would earn the nickname JC for jellyfish candy from Kevin Costner, after being stung by jellyfish seven different times during filming. The name Enola is borrowed from the infamous Enola Gay Bomber, the first aircraft to drop the atomic bomb on Hiroshima, Japan in August 1945. It's also, obviously, alone spelled backwards. Get it? For the tattoo on her back, writer Peter Rader had originally designed a complex method in which the light of a lunar eclipse could be used to decipher the location of dry land. However, this concept was cut in later revisions in favor of a more attractive design. The final tattoo using Chinese traditional characters, the words surrounding the arrow being the actual coordinates of Mount Everest. But more on that in a bit. The young actor would spend over an hour in makeup each day for the tattoo alone, in addition to the application of a full-body fake tan. Of course, Majorino and her co-star Jean Triplehorn would later appear together in the critically acclaimed 2006 HBO series, Big Love. Multiple actors were considered for the role of the Deacon, including Samuel L. Jackson, who opted to star in Die Hard with a Vengeance instead. The role also being declined by Gene Hackman, Gary Oldman, Gary Busey, Lawrence Fishburne, James Caan, and Jack Nicholson. The studio obviously wanting a larger-than-life personality to embody the character. The, uh, what, what, as uh, Letterman would say, what's the deal on your hair? Oh, yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm in the middle of doing a movie uh, with uh, Kevin Costner called Waterworld which right at the moment is the most expensive movie ever made. <clears throat> and uh, uh, I've just returned from shooting four months in Hawaii. Oh, that one where that really is the most expensive. No, no, they it, built this huge thing out there and they found that it rocks and ruins some of the shots. And you're in that? Well, I don't know if it rocks and ruins some of the shots. It's, oh, sometimes it's like, uh, gets a little rough out there. You might say, uh, I, I'd heard the late great director, writer, producer, and actor Dennis Hopper 
would join the production after the start of principal photography. And while the iconic figure came to the set with a reputation of being wild and unpredictable, cast and crew reportedly found him to be a complete professional, even under what were at times very trying circumstances. And Hopper would even teach co-star Gene Triplehorn how to play poker. Hopper's performance is at once part of what is so enjoyable about the film, but it is also the source of many complaints. The film's detractor citing the tonal shifts from more serious moments to the at times Looney Tune-like antics of Deacon and his smokers. The film also sports an impressive supporting cast of known character actors, including the late actors Michael Jetter as Old Gregor and Gerard Murphy as the Nord. And R.D. Call makes a strong impression with little dialogue as the Atoll Enforcer. Kim Coates leaves a big impression as the creepy drifter, and the film would also be the final on-screen appearance of character actor Rick Viles, who passed away at the age of just 42 a few months before the film's release. Robert Joy and Sean Whalen also appear as two smokers, and musician and comedian Jack Black also can be seen in one of his earliest roles as the smoker plane pilot. Most of the smokers, however, were played by members of the stunt crew. Kevin Costner was going through a difficult and highly publicized divorce at the time of filming, following a 16-year marriage that resulted in three children. And the Mariners' at times darker qualities can probably be attributed to the turmoil in Costner's personal life as crafting the character was entirely within Costner's control, a major point of contention between he and Kevin Reynolds. Reynolds felt that the character should be played more stoically, and Costner wanted to lean closer to a swashbuckler's persona, something a little more charming and complex, and they more or less met in the middle. It was Reynolds who suggested adding gills to the character, which later became a subject of concern for studio executives, who felt the effects makeup looked like a vagina, something later digitally corrected by VFX artists in certain shots. While their experience on Waterworld would sour their friendship for years to come, both personally and professionally, Costner and Reynolds would once again reunite in 2012 for the award-winning History Channel miniseries Hatfields and McCoys. Composer Mark Isham had provided the music for many popular films in the early 1990s, and seemed like a natural choice to score Waterworld, also previously having worked with director Kevin Reynolds on his 1988 war movie, The Beast. However, after reviewing an early cut of the film, of which only 25% of Isham's score was completed, Costner and the other producers felt the tone of the film was too dark, primarily citing Isham's composition as the culprit, telling the composer that his music was, quote, too ethnic and bleak for the more adventurous and lighthearted tone they hoped to achieve. And while Isham pleaded for a second opportunity, after director Kevin Reynolds left the film, Costner ultimately chose to replace Isham with composer James Newton Howard, hoping for a fresh start. Howard had previously worked with Costner on Wyatt Earp, and came with an ever-growing resume of strong compositions for numerous popular films throughout the 1980s and 90s. Howard was given just six weeks to compose the film's score, and immediately took to the more obvious genre elements on display, creating a more traditional swashbuckling sound for the film and its leading anti-hero. A departure in tone many behind the scenes felt betrayed the original dystopian concept. Fellow film composer Hans Zimmer, who was a major fan of Howard's work, offered to assist the composer in finishing his score after having caught word of Howard's extreme time constraints, granting Howard access to his entire personal sample library. To again speed up the process, Howard would partner with conductor Artie Kane to lead the orchestra while he composed further pieces for the film. The score for Waterworld can certainly be described as having been slapped together, 
And so it is perhaps a great credit to the talent of James Newton Howard that it remains one of the best action movie soundtracks of the 1990s. Howard himself considers his work on Waterworld to be some of his personal best. The film's official soundtrack would be released on compact disc one week after its release on August 1st, 1995 from Geffen Records, offering a total of 24 tracks. The soundtrack would see a digital release for the first time in January 2013, along with a limited edition two-disc release of Newton's complete remastered score from Universal and La La Land Records, featuring a total of 35 tracks as well as nine bonus tracks. The set also offered some insightful supplementary materials. I think the media doesn't have anything better to do. They, 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 they find a story like that, you know, maybe as a one-time story and then let's move on, but um, there must not be much for them to do. You know, it's like the person who doesn't have anything to do in the neighborhood, so they just pick on people. You know, it's like, wow, you know, they should get a life. There's a, there's a lot of things to report on. I mean, they should relax and realize that Universal Studios, who's made movies for the last 60 years, was concerned enough about the movie that they didn't need to be but it, it made for good, good, you know, fun press for them. And didn't make Waterworld would receive a slew of negative press throughout its lengthy production, with relentless reports of its filming woes and ever inflating budget blowing up the entertainment news cycle. Reports of the chaos and near mutiny ensuing following Reynolds' exit began to surface, and a narrative began to form that the film was doomed to fail. Some outlets went as far to perpetuate rumors that two camera operators were killed during shooting, which of course was completely false. As a result, the producers decided to ban press visits to the set altogether, which further soured their relationship with the media. But for one planet, the source of its demise, the temperatures climbed. The vast fields of ice at its poles melted, and the oceans rose. Centuries later, few people remain on this planet once called Earth. Among them, as the studio grew nervous about the production's mounting costs, they pushed the producers to create an official teaser trailer in order to generate some buzz, which would be attached to the Jean-Claude Van Damme video game movie, Street Fighter. Probably didn't help their cause. Not having completed filming outside of the Atoll sequences, the trailer mostly focused on the larger premise and mythology of the fictional future it presented, and was narrated by actor James Earl Jones, although the late voiceover artist Hal Douglas would provide the narration for the final film. As part of the marketing for the film, a 324-page novelization by author Max Allen Collins was published on July 1st, 1995 from Boulevard Books, just ahead of the film's release. The novel provides additional details about the operations of life in Waterworld, the dryland mythology, and various character backstories. Fun fact, author Max Allen Collins is not Sir Elton John. A behind-the-scenes chronicle titled The Making of Waterworld would also be published in August 1995 from journalist and author Janine Peroy, again by Boulevard Books. Universal Pictures would partner with the American toy maker Kenner to produce a line of action figures based on characters from the film, as well as a Waterworld vehicles toy line. Milton Bradley would also partner with the studio to produce a board game. The film received a 1995 video game tie-in of the same name developed by Ocean Software, made for the Super NES, Game Boy, and Nintendo Virtual Boy, the latter a failed gaming system that quickly vanished from store shelves. Of the 22 games released for the Virtual Boy, critics agreed that Waterworld was by far the worst. Versions were planned for the Sega Genesis and Dreamcast, as well as the Atari Jaguar, 3DO, and PlayStation, but these plans were later dropped. 
The Super NES and Game Boy editions were released in the UK and Australia only. The game was generally panned and failed to make a profit. The film would see another video game adaptation in 1997, developed by Interplay Entertainment and published by Intelligent Games, titled Waterworld – The Quest for Dry Land, with a few members of the original cast returning to lend their voices. Released for MS-DOS and Microsoft Windows, this version also received poor reviews. A pinball machine game was also created by Gottlieb Amusements the same year of the film's release. On a planet once called Earth, a child holds the secret to survival, and a lone man is her only hope. Kevin Costner, Waterworld, rated PG-13. Disastrous test screenings would lead to multiple last-minute edits of the film, test audiences feeling it was too confusing, and complained about many of the unfinished visual effects. Some reportedly even walked out of the screening upon learning the film they would be reviewing was Waterworld. Costner would be in the editing room just one week prior to the film's release. Waterworld hosted its official premiere at Man's Chinese Theater in Los Angeles on July 26, 1995 and would see its worldwide premiere on July 28, 1995. It would beat out the competition in its opening weekend, overtaking the Sandra Bullock cyber thriller The Net and dethroning the Tom Hanks drama Apollo 13 for the number one spot at the US box office with $21 million, and would hold the spot for two consecutive weeks. However, the film would go on to be considered a major financial flop going on to only gross a devastating $88 million at the North American box office. The film would also receive mostly mixed reviews, which combined with the coverage of its lackluster box office led to audiences generally staying away from cinemas. The film would become immediately defined by its evident failure and drew comparisons to other infamous box office duds of the time, such as Michael Cimino's epic Western Heaven's Gate and Warren Beatty's big budget comedy Ishtar. The film would, however, go on to receive an Oscar nomination for Best Sound at the 68th Annual Academy Awards. That being said, it was also nominated for four 1996 Razzies, including Worst Picture, so do with that as you will. Over time, the film would not be a total loss for the studio, and through some tricky accounting, Universal Pictures would actually come out relatively unscathed. The complete cost to produce, market, and distribute Waterworld would total at $235 million, a highly inflated price tag from its original $60 million proposal, and the film eventually grossed $264 million worldwide by the end of its 1995 run, 55% of this total gross going to Universal Pictures, approximately $145 million. While this was certainly a financial disappointment and a loss at the time for the studio, the film never really stood a fighting chance with its gargantuan budget, a fate Titanic would manage to avoid just two years later. All that being said, in reality, Universal Pictures technically only spent $12 million making the film. In 1995, during the filming of Waterworld, Japanese media conglomerate Matsushita Electric, now Panasonic, sold Universal to fellow conglomerate and then the largest owner of alcoholic beverages in the world, Seagram. As part of the sale, Matsushita agreed to take on all costs for Waterworld up to that time of the sale, which by that point only cost Universal Pictures, now under Seagram, $12 million in post-production expenses. Now we know. And knowing is half the battle. A child holds the secret to survival, and a lone man will come for me. He will. Is her only hope. I want the girl. Kevin Costner, Waterworld, rated PG-13. The film would find its second life on the home entertainment market, and through subsequent home media releases, the film has actually managed to turn a profit of about eight million dollars. Premiering on VHS in 1995 and later on DVD for the first time in November 1998, 
The film would see its first Blu-ray release in October 2009, but wouldn't be given the royal treatment until 2019. At the time director Kevin Reynolds left the production, his cut of the film sat at just under three hours in length, and Coster and the other producers felt anxious about such a hefty runtime, especially after the failure of Costner's most recent epic. The film was eventually edited down to its now 135-minute theatrical version, but the additional unused footage was, fortunately, not lost to time. Stand there, kill something! Star with Gene Triplehorn in the network premiere with never-before-seen footage. <laughs> Waterworld, ABC next Sunday, parental discretion advised. In 1998, the film would make its network television debut on ABC in the United States, broadcasting a special TV cut of the film, which restored an additional 40 minutes of never-before-seen footage. This edit provides more details about life in the futuristic world and its inhabitants, as well as providing more insight into the smokers' spiritual beliefs and their ability to refine crude oil. It also focuses more strongly on the relationship between Helen and the Mariner, and delves more deeply into the mythology surrounding dry land. This version also restored the film's original twist ending, something director Kevin Reynolds referred to as the Planet of the Apes ending, showing Helen and Enola discovering a plaque in the ground from 1953, revealing that they have landed on the peak of Mount Everest. Of course, this version was also censored for language and violence to suit TV broadcast standards of the time. However, as years passed, the film began to amass a loyal cult movie fan base, leading to the creation of what has come to be known as the Ulysses cut of the film. Well, actually, it was several fan edits spread out across the internet's nerdy underbelly, made up of the footage from the television cut, with the censored portions fully restored. It was dubbed the Ulysses cut as a reference to the originally cut scene at the end of the film between the Mariner and Helen, where Helen gives the Mariner the name Ulysses from the story of the Greek warrior, also known as Odysseus. While the TV cut, also known as the extended cut, would see a release on DVD in November 2008, the Ulysses cut would be officially sanctioned by the home media distributor Arrow Video and released for the first time in January 2019 as part of an exclusive Blu-ray box set, which also featured the other two cuts of the film, all restored from a 4K scan of the original film negatives, although the presentation is not in 4K. This Blu-ray release also provides stunning original box art in addition to several never-before-seen special features. The theatrical cut would later receive a 4K Blu-ray release in July 2019, with the extended TV version included, but this release did not officially include the Ulysses cut. The film would have a sequel of sorts in the form of a four-issue comic book limited series entitled Waterworld Children of Leviathan, published by Acclaim Comics in 1997. Kevin Costner refused to authorize the use of his likeness for the adaptation, so the Mariner has an altered appearance as a result. The story follows the Mariner as he uncovers his own past and the origins of his mutation, while also further exploring the melting of the polar ice caps and the creation of Waterworld. The story speculates that the Mariner's creation may have been due to genetic manipulation, not evolution, somehow related to the Sea Eater, the monster fish seen in the film. The comic book introduces a new villain in the form of Leviathan, Deacon Superior and the supplier of the smokers. Ready for a tidal wave of action, live at Universal Studios. Catch your breath, then catch Waterworld Live, new at Universal Studios. It blows everything else out of the water. Perhaps one of the most popular lasting legacies of the film to this day, Waterworld, a live sea war spectacular, premiered at Universal Studios Hollywood on October 23, 1995, and later in Japan in 2001, followed by Singapore in 2010. 
The 20 minute show tells the story of Helen returning to the atoll and she and the mariner facing off once again against the deacon and his smokers, revealing that he had survived the events of the film. While the movie Waterworld floundered, both critically and financially, the themed attraction would open to immediate praise for its daring stunts and complex ingenuity. It would go on to win the 1996 CEO Award from the Themed Entertainment Association, and the ever successful attraction still offers regular showings at all three locations to this day. Waterworld is a film that I genuinely love, having discovered it on VHS as a kid in the mid-1990s. While perhaps a little overambitious and a classic case of too many cooks in the kitchen, the film is still an enthralling and massively entertaining adventure thrill ride, featuring incredible groundbreaking stunts, state-of-the-art effects, fun performances from an exceptional cast, jaw-dropping production design, thrilling music, and energetic direction as pure a summer blockbuster there ever could be, but unfortunately, one that never was. True, it's no masterpiece, but while we never saw any official sequels, Waterworld is a place I enjoy returning to time and time again. The kind of film that doesn't pressure or challenge the viewer, but doesn't bore them either, and much like its theme park counterpart, it simply asks you to turn off your brain, sit back, and enjoy the show. Would you say that this changed you in any way, making this movie? You know, it obviously changed me personally. My life is, is constantly changing and moving forward, so I don't exactly know where I'm at. You know, I, I know about movies, and I know about what interests me, and, and uh, those, are the, those are the things that I just try and think about. Costner would seemingly not learn his lesson after the experience of Waterworld going on to cause further career damage with the 1997 box office disaster, The Postman, another three-hour post-apocalyptic epic where he plays, yet again, a mysterious drifter-turned-world savior. But that's a story for another time. So guys, tell me your thoughts on Waterworld. Do you love it, or do you tend to side with the critics? on this one, and if you do like the film, would you be more interested in a sequel, prequel, remake, or spin-off? And as always guys, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, go ahead and click like below and feel free to share, and don't forget to find me on Patreon at forward slash late never saw, where you'll gain early access to my channel's content and more. And of course, if you want to see more videos just like this one, go ahead and click subscribe.